This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. When I was in high school, I dated this girl whose father was a doctor. He was a nice guy, big, lots of opinions, not terrifying at all to skinny 17-year-old me with baggy pants and terrible taste in music. One of his opinions, one of his biggest pet peeves, he said once, and I imagine he meant this in the way that most people mean it when they say, you know what one of my biggest pet peeves is? And then they detail some slight annoyance, something not much beyond the inconvenience of a medium bad hangnail. One of his biggest pet peeves, he said once, is when someone in a movie dies, and then someone else brushes their still open eyes shut, putting them to rest, giving them peace. That would never work, I heard him say to a television screen once. After looking into it, it turns out it does work, just not how it works in the movies. You can close deceased eyelids, but sometimes it's difficult. Rigor mortis sets in on the eyelids quickly. That was ex-girlfriend's dad's gripe, that rigor mortis gets to the eyelids first. I guess because of how thin the skin is, and because of the way the muscle tension for that part of the body works. I don't really know, I'm not a doctor. But I also read that it's pretty likely those eyes will pop right back open after not too long, if, you know, if you can get them closed. So then, what we're saying is that you can do it, but it might not be easy or permanent. Apparently, morticians sometimes use glue, makeup, and all kinds of other tricks to keep the eyes of the deceased shut in the event of an open casket viewing. Regardless, most of us would consider this maneuver an honest-to-goodness thing. A thing you can do with ease and effectiveness, as it's shown in those tender movie moments even though you can't. Not exactly, anyway. It's verisimilitude, the appearance of reality by consensus, as opposed to verisimilitude by truth. Which was really what ex-girlfriend's dad was up in shirt sleeve arms about. He wasn't part of the consensus, his professional expertise prevented that. In the way lawyers probably get frustrated watching The Good Wife and service people with any war movie, doctors, I'm sure, resist all kinds of consensus-built verisimilitude related to medicine, the body, and so on. For them, inaccurate tropes like the closing of the eyelids or the use of a defibrillator in any and every situation where a patient has flatlined no longer represent a heartfelt final moment or a last-ditch struggle to save a dying person. They instead represent only themselves. The reference turns back around and reminds savvy viewers that they are watching a TV show made by people who need to hire a consultant next time. That is what we're going to talk about in this episode of Reasonably Sound, except, of course, the sound version. We're going to talk about overused sound effects and how they're meant to represent one thing, but eventually they end up representing only or mostly themselves and sometimes their weird histories or other uses. There are a good number of overused sound effects, actually. You'll probably recognize most of the ones that we're going to talk about, which, I mean, I I guess it's, it's maybe worth warning you. After listening to this episode, you're going to hear them everywhere. Because they are everywhere. 
movies, TV shows, video games, books on tape. So if you don't want to willingly open your ears to the world of hilariously overused sound effects, now's the time to switch over to another Infinite Guest podcast. The most recent episodes of both Tiny Sense of Accomplishment and Top Score are really, really good if you're looking for recommendations. If you still need some time to decide, though, if you're ready to possess such infernal knowledge, you, you have a couple minutes. Before we talk about specific sound effects, it's probably a good idea to talk about sound effects in general. Things don't sound the way you think they sound. This thesis explains the existence of sound effects. To your ear, the world sounds one way, but to your mind's ear, another way. The journey from acoustic vibration to electrical impulse might be short, but there's a lot of baggage picked up on the way. Our ideas of what a creaky door, a blood-curdling scream, a pistol firing, or a car zooming by sound like, they're influenced by direct sonic experience, sure, but also a lot more. Our ideas of those sounds, as opposed to the sounds themselves as they happen in the world, are significantly their own. They're a separate piece of sonic information, a simulacra, if you want to get technical, a copy without a true original. In a film, then, or a TV show or video game, in media, to play back exactly some perfect and pristine field recording of a car zooming by, a recording nearly scientific in its sonic accuracy, there's a great chance it'll be ineffective, is maybe the word? Though the sound is exactly the vibrations to have traveled through the air, it is no longer itself. It's dull, occupying some weird space between too real and not real enough, most often lacking oomph or depth, a certain, as the French might say, I don't know what. Real-world sounds fall somewhat short in the hyper-real context of audiovisual media. With some obvious exceptions like documentary or the Dogma 95 films where the directors took it as something of a moral imperative to only use sounds produced by practical objects on set during filming. Those situations and a few others provide notable exceptions. In general, though, as far as sound effects employed by the kinds of movies which choose to employ sound effects, we might describe the above problem as one of accuracy over precision. Accuracy occurs when results fall close to what is normatively ideal, what it seems like the system describes as success. If one is shooting arrows, for instance, the accuracy is hitting the bullseye. A field recording in a quiet area using high-quality gear can be incredibly accurate. It hits the bullseye, gets it exactly right, recording accurately what is heard in a specific place at a particular time. Precision, on the other hand, is the clustering of results, putting a bunch of arrows in the same place. So if one were to put a bunch of arrows right next to one another, all in the bullseye, that is high accuracy and high precision. If one were to tightly cluster a whole group of arrows five inches to the left of the bullseye, you would say that they are very precise, but not very accurate. The use of exactly sounds as they occur, in my view, is the reverse. It's not very precise, but potentially super accurate. That'd be like a loose grouping of arrows, sort of near and around the bullseye. All of these sounds have a relationship to exactly how the thing sounds, some closer than others, but really, weirdly, the bullseye isn't what we should be aiming for. We don't want exactly the sound. We want some heightened, maybe even abstracted version of the sound. The goal of media sound effects, I think, are to be more precise than they are accurate. To group closely together in some not exactly accurate area of this imagined audio archery target, such that they reference our idea of a certain sound, but are not so concerned with being exactly as it is in the real world. Because the real world is just... 
I don't know, sometimes it's just not interesting or exciting or fun to listen to. The best examples of this, I think, are punching sound effects. Even if you're not a boxer or have never been in a real fist fight, you probably know somewhere deep down that when one person hits another person in the chin with their fist, it doesn't make this sound. It makes a significantly less exciting sound that's sort of like two stakes hitting one another because I guess roughly that's exactly what it is. But there is a great story about the Foley guys who worked on Rocky. I don't know if it's true, but I heard that no two of the punching sounds in that movie are exactly the same, and that the team recorded actual pieces of meat hitting one another, or themselves punching these sides of beef, hitting it with planks of wood, and so on and so forth, and then they would watch the film, and to their meat-smacking sounds, they would add paper ripping, bass drum kicks, cars backfiring, depending upon if the depicted biff appeared to cause audible damage, like a broken jaw or nose, a cracked tooth or a split brow. Things you'd not be able to hear in real life, not as presently at least, but in the heightened circumstances of a film, feels like maybe you would. Or should. There are a good number of sound effects that are used frequently. Oh, and if you wanted to tune out for the part where I describe a couple of really overused sounds, now is the time. There are lots. Some of them are, I imagine, sort of like sound design inside jokes. Sounds which you would never include in a finished work without intending to make some kind of reference to its overuse. But really, lots of them are also actually just good sounds. They're clear, well put together, distinct, in a word, iconic. They clearly reference exactly the thing that they are, even if they aren't sonically exactly that thing. They play well to our sensibilities, if not the world's actualities. They are very, very precise, if a little inaccurate. Many of them, not all, but many are also available on sound effects libraries. It probably goes without saying, but the business of recording sounds for use in media is not simple. If you need the sound of, say, a large angry dog barking, there are probably more than a few things that will keep you from going out into the world to harvest that one personally. The solution to this problem is a set of widely available, though frequently prohibitively expensive collections of sounds which are freely licensed, meaning after one has paid the exorbitant cost for access to the sounds themselves, no additional money needs to be paid based upon where or how they're used. Reasonably Sound actually makes use of a good number of sound effects libraries that I acquired on just an unreasonable number of CDs back in my days as a sound designer for theater. Without them, the task of illustrating a great many principles of how the world sounds would be much more difficult and potentially dangerous. Like, remember that time in episode one where we listened to the sound of a tree falling? I love you guys, but I, I don't know that I would be willing to go out and get that one myself. Anyways. That's another important factor here. In the gargantuan archive of freely available sounds out there, organized into a countless number of professionally produced sound effects libraries, there sits dozens if not hundreds of sounds put together for the purpose of inclusion in your video game. And once someone makes a characteristic use of a sound, once a sound is picked and placed with skill, it takes on a bit of a life of its own. We know this from, say, Hans Zimmer's Inception, Bwomp, which has been imitated over and over and over again in subsequent movie scores to lesser effect, but which cannot be used directly because it is copywritten. It's not freely available. This sound effect of a man screaming in pain, however, yeah! is not only incredibly popular and used constantly, it was the basis for the sound TIE Fighters make in Star Wars, it is also available. 
royalty and license free from the Sound Ideas slash Hollywood Edge Premier Edition Sound Effects Library. It is labeled Screams 3. Man. Gut-wrenching scream and fall into distance. Mostly, though, you hear this sound referred to as the Howie scream. So anyways, to summarize, this is how a sound effect becomes overused, I think. It starts as a kind of sound icon, with a strong and undeniable resemblance to its referent. Over time, and through constant use, it becomes a reference to itself. By using these sounds, you're referencing the use of these sounds. And of course, the easier they are to use, the more they will be used. Which, well, I guess enough generalities, I think. Let's talk about a few sound effects which fit this description. There are tons. We're going to talk about five. First, a personal favorite, and by favorite I mean it drives me mad how often I hear this sound, the creaky metal door. I sometimes call this one the gate of hell because it most often is used in situations where someone is in trouble. Nice doors maintained by a staff of caring professionals in a well-lit facility do not make this sound. This sound is not made by a light door on the other side of which is a nice glass of Pinot with a view of the ocean. This sound is made by heavy metal doors opened and closed all day by people with other much more sinister business in mind. Or by a door that hasn't been opened more than five times in the last decade. Rusty hinges hung unlevel in its frame. The creaky metal door sound is not good news. The range of hardware which produces this foreboding creak is vast, though. Prison gates and solitary confinement doors, dimly lit warehouse fire doors, indestructible looking airlocks and blast doors. Sometimes the creaky door is slowed down a little if the door is really heavy or big or old. And for the life of me, I can't find any history about the creaky metal door, probably because it's not what it's actually called by the people who recorded it and released it in whatever form led to its widespread use. So it's hard for me to tell you exactly the places it's used. I last remember hearing it on an old episode of MacGyver of all places, but I promise if you keep your ears perked, you are going to hear this one everywhere. The Diddy Laugh. (laughs) So-called because it is used very prominently in the intro sequence for the Nintendo 64 game Diddy Kong Racing. I don't think that Diddy Kong Racing is responsible for the creation of this sound effect, but it is a very early and very prominent use of a sound effect which is now used any time a reference to the frivolity of youth is needed. From what I can tell, it's either three or four voices of young children just, you know, having a jolly good time. It's used pretty much exclusively in earnest, which I have such a hard time with because I just... I don't know, children laughing sound effects sort of creep me out. For some reason, I can't help but respond to this kind of disembodied children giggling sound with anything other than some deep sense of foreboding. When I hear this sound, I go right to the Shining or the immediately pre-apocalypse scenes from Terminator 2, you know, the ones in the, in the playground. We talked a little bit in a previous episode about Michel Chion's idea of an empathetic sound when the audio is playing against the emotional content of a scene and therefore amplifying its effect. And for whatever reason, I only ever hear the Diddy laugh as an empathetic, even though generally it's intended to be strictly empathetic. The Diddy Laugh is used in StarCraft II, Hot Fuzz, The Venture Brothers, Star Wars Episode I, the 2008 Rambo movie, among many, many others. TV Tropes has a great list of media which have used the Diddy Laugh on its stock sound effects page, and Mr. Steve Paget, Steve, if you end up listening to this, one, I hope that I'm pronouncing your name right, and two, thank you for doing the work that you were doing, has a constantly growing list on his website, diddylaugh.blogspot.com. Com. The female police dispatcher. Hi, it's 
The female police dispatcher is also strongly associated with a video game, this time SimCity 3000. Having never played SimCity 3000, I can't speak to its ubiquity, but apparently it is played whenever a player constructs a police station, which is, I understand, a very important building. Makes sense. I associate this sound with TV police dramas and their chase scenes. For some reason, it feels particularly 90s, though I am sure I have heard it much more recently. The internet hordes seem to implicate Law and & Order and X-Files as frequent users of this sound effect. And speaking of the internet, there are even entire message board threads where people attempt to figure out what this dispatcher is saying. Hi, it's going for 148 North St. Andrews, Prowler, Exactly. TV Tropes guesses 7865, code 6, 105, North Avenue. Some people hear 141, celibacy, or clear the 128. Whatever the content of the actual sound effect, though, I think the timbre and shape of this sound is what make it so distinct. The quality is that great, thin radio sound, and the voice itself has such a good ring to it. It's a little thin but firm, all business. Whoever this woman is, she did a pretty good job. The rhythm is one that we might associate with this type of communication, too. It's brisk, with emphasis on the front of the phrase, and then nice, even-ish segments as it winds down towards the end. I'm always reminded of how one might mimic a truck driver. Trigger Bear 19, this is Big Mike from the Big Apple. Nasalish, with all of the emphasis up front. <laughs> Castle Thunder. Castle Thunder isn't used so much anymore. It was in heavy rotation up until about the late 80s, particularly in animated films. But it and our next and final sound effect are such recognizable mainstays of sound design that it would be an oversight to pass them up. Castle Thunder was originally recorded in 1931 for the film Frankenstein, starring Colin Clive as Dr. Frankenstein and Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster. It was actually this movie that would cement the most popular rendering of the monster, with his flat head and matted down hair and neck bolts. And in the way that there would be many versions of Frankenstein's monster that reference Karloff's green, blocky instance, there are many versions of Castle Thunder. Over the years, engineers have reworked and reincorporated Castle Thunder in their spooky scenes, and much like the current lineup of the punk rock band The Misfits, it resembles the original, but mostly in name only. Here are a couple versions of Castle Thunder, starting with the original you've already heard, and ending with one of the newer, probably pretty recognizable versions. This is pulled straight from a YouTube video uploaded by Wiley K209 Zback. It's about a minute and 30 seconds long. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Castle Thunder was named so because of the very fact that most often it was used in establishing shots of menacing or imposing castle-like exteriors. A large, shadowy mansion, a creepy cathedral, a stone rampart, and the related spoopy weather conditions. Which actually gets to an interesting point. Castle Thunder has no rain, which almost never happens in the real world, thunder without rain. And the thunderclap is really quick, almost 10 times shorter than most thunderclaps. 
For me, Castle Thunder bumps into the accurate versus precise distinction more than most other frequently used sound effects for the fact that it is so unnatural. Weirdly quiet when it's used without adding rain sound effects, and weirdly terse when not combined with a longer, more natural rolling thunder. But the message it conveys is clear, and until I really started to think about it, I never really questioned its presence or accuracy when placed alongside some foreboding setting. And finally, the granddaddy of all overused sound effects, the Wilhelm scream. The Wilhelm scream is to sound effects what Folgers is to coffee or Ikea is to furniture. It's, you know, fine. It's good. It gets the job done. It could be better, but even so, it is everywhere. Some confluence of events have conspired to deem it the paradigmatic example of its category. The Wilhelm scream was recorded in the early 50s for a movie called Distant Drums. In the film, some men are trudging through a swamp when one of them is suddenly snatched by an alligator. He has dragged underwater, but not before issuing his scream heard round the world. In her amazing essay, The Wilhelm Scream, which if you can find it, you should definitely read it, Elena Passareo opens with a fictional speculative excerpt of the Distant Drums screenplay, the portion which would eventually call for the Wilhelm Scream to be recorded. It reads, 1951. Exterior. Swamp. Day. The camera rolls. A patsy stands waist deep in a sound stage mock up of Florida alligator water. Chicken eyes, hat askew, no gun. They never give guys like this a gun. The water around him burbles. Something's got his right leg. The patsy kicks that leg forward, throws back his hands, opens his mouth, and makes absolutely no noise. No noise because the noise, the Wilhelm scream, was recorded later by someone else. Someone in a studio somewhere doing post work, an ADR guy. Passareo calls him a looper. Guys who watch loops of the edit making the sounds which were not recorded on set during production because it was too complicated or expensive or impossible. It's not known exactly who this guy was, the one who crafted the scream, but according to a couple sources, it's pretty likely to have been Sheb Woolley. A singer, an actor, and a man, you might have noticed, who is definitely not named Wilhelm. Not even a little. The Wilhelm scream gets its name from an early use, but not the first use, not the one in Distant Drums. In a 1953 cowboy flick called The Charge at Feather River, a private named Wilhelm is struck in the leg with an arrow. Wilhelm! Yeah, I'll just fill my pipe! Wilhelm is played by Ralph Brooks, but upon being shot by an arrow, is voiced, probably, by Sheb Woolley. Since then, Wilhelm's pained shriek has been the tolling bell for unfortunate injuries and unexpected deaths in over 300 films. Ben Burtt, the sound designer for George Lucas and the Star Wars films, is credited with popularizing Wilhelm and naming it, but there is, appropriately, something of a Frankenstein's monster effect here. Wilhelm is still Wilhelm, to the degree he was Wilhelm to begin with, which you could call into question given the tension between actor Ralph and vocalist Sheb, but Wilhelm is also now the use of Wilhelm. The signal that one is in on the joke part of the story. Wilhelm's is a voice that signals some untimely demise, but also some knowing demonstration. However you look at it, Ben Burtt's creation has maybe gotten a little out of hand. It is, more than any other of these sounds, I think the most accurate. A sound made by one person into a microphone, and as far as we know, relatively untransformed. Exactly the vibrations to have traveled through the air. Though, luckily, not the actual scream of an actual person actually suffering. It's worth asking, though. Were someone shot with an arrow, dragged under the swamp waters by an alligator? If this is the sound they would make, 
Or maybe to put it another way that is perhaps a little easier and more fair, it's not that the Wilhelm scream isn't exactly a scream, it's that its usage, the places it's been deployed, the assumed attitude of the post-production audio professionals who incorporate it, have somehow made it more than a scream. Wilhelm is a sound that has issued from the mouths of hundreds of injured or dying characters. Sheb Woolley's widow, Linda Dotson Woolley, said that Sheb joked about this frequently before his own death. How great he was at screaming. That his legacy would be the post-production death knell sound effect. Composer and theorist Pierre Schaeffer called acousmatic sounds which are produced while their source is unseen. For Schaeffer, who pioneered a kind of music called music concrete, where real-world sounds were bent and warped, shifted and stretched using what was then brand new tape equipment, the idea was to disembody the voice of the machine to take trains and motors and cars and machines and to capture their sound, reproduce it through speakers and audio technology without the need for their bodies. For Schaefer, this was even something of a radical proposition. The record player, the radio. These are acousmatic technologies. When we talk about these sound effects, we're also in some sense talking about the acousmatic, the sound with an unseen source. Not just because maybe there is the sound of a car rumbling past and the car is not shown in the frame of the movie isn't captured by the camera. I mean the sound which in some of these cases has an unseen source because the source doesn't exist. Because they are sounds harvested not from some unseen place of emanation but conjured through some technological process. For these overused effects, especially, we may see the door closing or the castle shrouded in fog and we hear the creaking hinges or the thunder, but the source for these things is still unseen. Because through their overuse, we know them as themselves, not as the sounds of the environments pictured. To put it in Michelle Shion's words, which I have a tendency to do, the sounds move from diegetic to non-diegetic, from seeming to be of the world of the media to clearly placed on top of it, added to it later. As Wilhelm's scream references the scream of the on-camera personality less and less, and itself more and more, it likewise goes from diegetic to not, from direct or acoustic to acousmatic, from sound to sound effect. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and me on Tumblr, Instagram, and Twitter at Mike Rignetta.